How do the economic and strategic consequences of China's exclusion from the TPP weigh against gains it's won through the Silk Road Project, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, and the New Development Bank? I think that's an extremely good question. Uh, partly because China is, I think, internally conflicted on, on that question. There certainly are gains that would be had uh, by the TPP if China were a member. Um, it's a high quality agreement, uh, the benefits for the service industry, possibly the evolution of finance, uh, possibly for Western investment and so on would be there. Western firms would have more confidence, I think, in investing in China uh, if the high quality TPP agreement were extended there and it should expand China's trade with um, the, the Pacific nations as well. Um, that said, however, um, I think the new continentalism and the development of ties across the continent because of the AIB and the infrastructure projects and so on, they produce benefits for the steel industry, the uh, construction, a, a different part of the Chinese political economy um, for the party, for the military, uh, the, they've traditionally been involved in developments uh, to the West and, and on land. So uh, in terms of the sort of narrow value improvement in value added and so on, I think it could be that the costs of not being in TPP would be uh, greater for uh, China uh, than the benefits. Uh, in terms of short-term GDP growth, uh, support for some of the heavy industrial sectors, possibly even economic growth in the short run, I think the uh, new Silk Road, the One Belt, One Road, does have uh, significant uh, benefits for China. And, and then also on the geopolitical calculus, it takes them across the continent. How will impending developments in climate change policy affect continental relations? The expansion of the use of energy would naturally be the result of increased growth uh, across the continent. Uh, China has been traditionally reliant on coal, so has India. And in that sense, the acceleration of economic growth would intensify the environmental problems. That is one uh, very ominous implication, I think, of continentalism. That said, the uh, countries of Asia can also potentially cooperate on uh, environmental uh, uh, protection, energy efficiency, technology. Um, Japan is strong in that area. Uh, China is a leading producer of uh, solar panels and promoting solar energy. Um, the Middle East, uh, countries like the UAE are also promoting uh, energy efficiency. So. How do trends such as rising Chinese FDI in the EU or China's offloading of foreign assets affect the symmetry of China's interdependence with EU countries? Well, uh, I think China's um, relationships with the EU certainly are expanding um, quite dramatically. Uh, I see these things not just in quantitative terms, but in the ways that China can address the structural problems that Europe has today. Uh, for example, support uh, for the Euro, uh, I think is important in the, in the wake of the Greek crisis and the possibility that we'll see other crises of that kind. Indirect uh, geopolitical support by China for Europe, uh, I think is also extremely important given the fragile uh, nature of Europe, uh, uh, and the expansion of NATO uh, that has occurred in the last uh, decade and the challenge that Russia presents now. There, China has a fair amount of leverage, I think, under the, st the current status quo. Of course, as China's growth slows, it could be that the balance of influence between uh, Europe and China will shift in Europe's favor again.